Let's talk about the Yamanaka factors. All right. Yeah. That's my favorite topic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, what are they? Well, Yamanaka factors are like the transcription factors that this guy, Yamanaka, Shinya Yamanaka, discovered back in like 2006. He was basically looking at things that can rewind a cell back into embryonic state. Mm. And he was looking at like a panel of 24 different genetic factors. Like a transcription factor is just like a genetic mechanism that goes inside like the nucleus and like changes gene expression changes yeah. what genes are turned on and off and can do like a massive kind of remodeling of, of a cell and it turned out that those four if you use them together they do not just you know massive remodeling they can actually bring it back to embryonic state where that cell can now again become anything you want in the body because you know what what is so special about like an embryonic stem cell yeah that it can turn into pretty much any cell in your body it's a naive and cell it's they yeah. thought yeah it, before that before yamanaka they thought that this, this is a, like a one-way street that you cannot come back your skill ki skin cell cannot be back like turned back into an embryo right they thought it's like the, the waterfall like the one, one direction yeah. model where yeah it just kind of rolls down and it can't get back up and yamanaka like turned it all in, on his head and said no you actually can you can any cell that has a nucleus can turn back into like embryonic cell and again you can create an embryo, like you can create your own clones from your skin cells or whatever, and yeah, other kind of cell, which is a scary prospect, but that's that's beyond. <laughs> so this is kind of like, so this would be kind of similar to like stem cells, where yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like it's even like a more even more potent stem cell. As Correct. It's an embryonic stem cell. But so theoretically, I would, I can draw my blood theoretically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, apply through the therapy of stimulating the Yamanaka factors mm -hmm. into my, my my drawn blood. Let those cells then go back to uh, a younger version of it, right? And then re-inject it into me. Well, that's one of the ways. Yeah, you, you can create stem cells out of those, or yeah. you can take your own stem cells and kind of rejuvenate them using you know, Yamanaka factors. Kind of roll it back. But how are we stimulating the Yamanaka factors? Well, you have to kind of get them into the cell. You have to either get the genes for these factors into the cell and get the cell to start, you know, creating proteins from those genes, okay. the actual transcription factors, or you can get the the, the the actual proteins, the Yamanaka factors into the cell. Of course, usually the the easier way is to do the gene thing because we have a lot of instruments that can insert needed genes so CRISPR tech would be used on this I mean CRISPR is yeah it's it's one of the ways but uh, I mean uh, they, they have have kind of uh, AAVs that then associated viruses that mm -hmm. do like a or you specialized for this for gene delivery I mean CRISPR is more used for like cutting stuff and you still yeah, need the RNA cut it out but yeah yeah pretty much yeah uh, and so yeah once you get those those genes into the cell and if you activate them they they can roll back the cell back to this kind of pluripotent state and not only do they do that they rejuvenate it in the process so if it was like a hundred year old skin cell that you had with kind of all these kind of problems that a hundred year old cell exhibits like i don't know like misfolded proteins or it reduced mitochondrial efficiency mitochondrial function if you induce Yamanaka factors roll it back to the pluripotent state and then create another again you know make it induce it to become a skin cell again that new skin cell will be completely rejuvenated it have the you know, normal young levels of mitochondrial oh. function all the misfolded proteins so where we are today with the research for this like this seems to be like it's it's happening and yeah i mean the the of course on the cellular level the creating in uh, pluripotent stem cells they've been researching it as, as soon as the in 2006 yamanaka pu published this paper but what just recently scientists in the aging field realized that uh you can use this in vivo like in the animal if you activate those factors just you know at, at, in the right dosage then you can rejuvenate the animal itself like systemically and make that animal live longer wow. which is yeah which is i think is a, that's the groundbreaking thing because it's one thing to just you know take cells so and they've make, done this yeah they have uh, that's On what? rats mice mice yeah uh, it was a transgenic mouse line that was already like kind of predisposed to living much shorter periods okay. so they haven't been able to uh, do this in normally aged mice, which is kind of right. That's where the field stands right now. This is like the the next milestone we need to accomplish. We need to take these factors and make a normal aging mice that usually lives like two and a half years rather than like uh, I don't know three months, and make it live longer as long as possible. And this 
this milestone is still to be accomplished. But the, the proof of concept that uh, was shown in 2016, this paper out of Salk Institute by Ocampo, it showed that you can use this kind of gene therapy in our bodies, to inducing Yamanaka factors to prolong lifespan. And this dovetails very well with the idea that aging is an epigenetically controlled process. Yes. Because, you know, Yamanaka factors, that's what they're doing. They're kind of rewinding the epigenetic clock backwards to the, you know, you know, time zero where it's an embryonic cell, which has by definition age zero, epigenetic age zero. And the, luckily, this rewinding process is gradual. And, you know, we're just, it, it didn't have to be, it could be like a bin, could have been a binary thing where, you know, cell, cell is an old cell, you know, skin cell, and somehow it's rolled back into embryonic cell, but like not in a gradual way. But luckily, it is a gradual process where if we kind of cut off this kind of reprogramming process just in time, so the cell still remains a skin cell, we can gain the rejuvenation aspect without losing the kind of cell identity. And this is important because that's the, I, that's the kind of danger right now of this process, that when cells are taken too far, they lose their identity as a skin cell, they become kind of this kind of lost in the no man's land where they're not yet an embryonic mm -hmm. cell, that this kind of in between thing then you can get all kinds of problems and that's why animal dies. They, they develop these teratomas, it's pretty much like cancer, cancerous tumors uh, from this process and this is what we need to iron out. We need to make this process safe so that you know, there's no side effects and then of course efficacious so that it extends lifespan by you know, significant amounts. So that but it's very, uh, it's very exciting because all of the uh, signs are pointing that uh, if we learn to control these uh, the epigenetic process of aging, then we can uh, periodically kind of rewind this e epigenetic clock. And this is another thing. This has revolutionized the field of aging research, the discovery of the epigenetic clock that we have in our bodies. Uh, it was like in 2013, and uh, even before that, there was uh, the famous, most famous scientist, is Steve Horvath. I'm, I'm pretty sure you've mm -hmm. heard of him, of developing this epigenetic clock of aging. It was discovered that, you know, everybody, uh, a person of a certain age, has a very similar level of specific genes, like their epigenetic levels of these genes are the same, which was kind of weird. I mean, why would uh, our bodies... Uh, develop in such a predictable way because initially we thought that aging is uh, like a stochastic process and it, by that definition uh, all this uh, uh, like epigenetic settings should diverge right you, you wouldn't you shouldn't be able to like take two two random people of the same age and uh, have the same levels of certain genes uh, being expressed right and so it was discovered that there is actually a subset of genes that change in a very predictable way so that you could take a cell from anybody without knowing, knowing their age and just using this analysis of uh, like epigenetic patterns, you're able to say, I you know, how old the person is. Yeah, the cellular is. age. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, and you know, not just one type of tissue, that there's a universal epigenetic clock that you could take like your blood and then uh, it's epigenetic clock will correlate with the you know your neurons yes and this is very very odd because it's very different cells you know neuron is as old as your you are yes. right because you had it from being an embryo but blood cells renew all the time but at an ep epigenetic clock level you know the clock is showing the same time and this is very, very strange because it's showing that there is some kind of coordinated program in an you know, epigenetic program that hopefully will you know decipher one day and be able to hack it doesn't come as a surprise like you know the famous fly studies you look at like bemo clock and you know, all the circadian clocks mm -hmm. we know our our body functions on clocks of course and yeah like to people who are not like deep into biology it so it seems like common sense that of course there's some kind of program right because we we have life stages we know that at a certain age you know puberty starts and everybody about you know at the same age goes through it and then at another age like for women there's menopause and it's also pretty much predetermined at a certain age so our body does keep some kind of clock yes. uh, it does you know of course there's a circadian clock we you know we get you know want to go to sleep at a certain time and of course, it, it seems like common sense that the same kind of clock could be used to, to like internally, it needs to be synchronized, could be used for aging as well. And, but uh, for biologists, uh, I think uh, it was, it for some reason, was a surprise that, uh, you know, there could be some kind of coordinated process that is tied to aging. And even after, say, like, 
even after your uh, pro, uh, reproductive age stops, yeah. even after that, it's also synchronized. Yes. Which, you know, this kind of goes against the dogma that we only evolved up to the level of when reproduction stops. And after that, it's just, you know, mutations go wild and things should diverse, diverge in our bodies because that won't uh, be passed to our progeny because we won't have any more mm. progeny. But no, even after, you know, reproduction stops, for some reason, there's a lot of coordinated processes that occur in very similar at very similar rates uh, in in different people and this is odd uh, it kind of points to there being some kind of you know uh, synchronization between you know what happens to people during aging and i think it's a manifestation of an aging program that uh hopefully we're uh, just around the corner of being able to to decipher and uh, do something about it